Most serial killers send waves of terror across the world with their crimes, but some of them manage to go unnoticed for years. From Richard Conningham, who killed nearly 100 women, to the delusional Herbert Mullen, who killed 13 people to supposedly prevent deadly earthquakes, today we're talking about the most disturbed serial killers that you probably have never heard about. I wanted to be the best at whatever I did. And I wanted to be the best serial killer, yes. Obviously, I must be sick somehow. Uh, normal people don't do what I did. Richard Cunningham was only 21 when he committed his first murder. It was 1967 when a woman named Nancy Shavia Vogel, 29, married and mother of two, was strangled to death. Her nude body was found in her car, hands bound in front of her under a blanket behind the passenger seat in New Jersey. She had been seen last three days earlier when she left home stating she was going to play bingo with friends at the local church. The murder remained unsolved until Cottingham confessed and pleaded guilty to it 43 years later in 2010. Cottingham was married with three kids. He worked as a computer operator at the Empire State Blue Cross Blue Shield Insurance Company on 3rd Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, the 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift. His childhood had been fairly loving and happy, he had displayed no early signs of a serial killer. Most killers start showing some sort of indication at a young age, be it in the form of violence towards animals or consistent bedwetting or setting up fires. But Cottingham had shown none of these. He had never hurt a fly. Like many murderers, he was the picture of boring normalcy on the surface. But between work and family, he hid his animalistic desires that surfaced at night. He was a frequent patron of Times Square's explicit clubs and bars where he would hunt his victims. Although he preyed on night workers, it wasn't a pattern. He also killed mothers, career women, and horrifyingly, a 13-year-old girl. From 1967 to 1980, he committed numerous murders. He claims there was as much as 100, but so far he has been convicted of 11. Although his claim has never been verified, recent interviews with him in jail reveal that he may have started preying on women as an early teenager. Oh, I know exactly how many. How many? <laughs> Over 85, under 100. I was doing this for years, hardly a week or two went by without something happening. So you're saying you were killing a victim every week? Every couple of weeks on average. For how many years? I can't tell you that, but well over 10. Little is known about the motive behind the murders. The victims were picked up at random and Cottingham took pleasure in torturing and fully abusing women. He has been called the Torso Killer and the Times Square Killer after the truly horrific murder of Dita Godarzi. On December 2nd, 1979, firemen in New York responded to an alarm at the Travel Inn Motel near Times Square. Inside, they found two bodies, both of their hands and heads cut off and had been doused with lighter fluid and set on fire. The missing body parts were never found. As Cottingham was fleeing the scene of the Torso murders, he briefly encountered the 23-year-old Peter Vranowski, who was attempting to check into the Travel Inn while in New York on a film production assignment. In 2009, in an interview, Cottingham admitted to the murders and claimed that he severed the heads and hands of the victims to prevent their identification, as he was acquainted with one of them, Dita Godarzi and had been seen with her in a bar the night before. Little did he know that Dita's daughter and the encounter with Peter would continue for years after he committed this crime. The brief meeting inspired Peter to later write the serial killer histories and paved the way for his prison meetings with Cunningham some 40 years later. Back in the 70s, DNA testing had not been discovered and Cunningham also had forensic knowledge, which is why he was able to dodge the police 
for years before being caught in 1980. 18-year-old Leslie Ann O'Dell had agreed to have intercourse with him for $100. Around dawn, they checked into a motel where Cottingham had already killed another woman, Valeria Street, 18 days ago, and left her body handcuffed under the bed. This did not deter him from using the same motel to commit another murder. In fact, he had become quite confident. No one had been able to pin any murder to him yet. Cottingham offered to give the girl a massage, and she rolled over onto her stomach. Straddling her back, he drew a knife and put it into her throat as he snapped a pair of handcuffs on her wrists. He began torturing her, nearly biting off one of her nipples. She later testified that he said, you have to take it. The other girls did. You have to take it too. You're a whore and you have to be punished. Odell's muffled cries of pain became so loud that the motel staff called police and then rushed to the room, demanding that Cottingham open the door. Cottingham was apprehended in the hallway by arriving police officers. When arrested, he had handcuffs, a leather gag, two slave collars, a switchblade knife, replica pistols, and a stockpile of prescription pills. He was 34 at that time. He pleaded not guilty, but once police searched his house, he was sent to bars for the remainder of his life. They found a trophy room in the basement of his apartment where he kept his victim's belongings. In a series of trials between 1981 and 1984, Cottingham was convicted of five murders and sentenced to hundreds of years in prison. He pleaded innocent with the hope that his family might believe him. Amongst the five was 19-year-old Valerie Ann Street, who had been bruised and beaten around her head and body, bitten on the breast and handcuffed. The police later lifted a fingerprint matching Cottingham, the only fingerprint successfully found on any of his known murders. Another was radiologist Marianne Carr, who had been brutally beaten and strangled in the parking lot of the Quality Inn Motel, same as Valerie. Carr had marks around her wrists and ankles, indicative of handcuffs, and traces of adhesive tape around her mouth. Her body also bore numerous small cuts and bite marks. He was also convicted of the murder of 25-year-old Jean Marianne Rayner, who was strangled and her throat cut in the historic Seville Hotel. The crime scene was one of plain horror. Cottingham spurred the victim's breasts and posed them on the headboard of the bed and set fire to the mattress under her body before fleeing, similar to the travel and torso killings of Dita and her friend. Dita's daughter, Jennifer Weiss, later proved to be instrumental in making Cottingham confess to more murders. It all began when Jennifer found out she had been adopted she went on the hunt for her mother, which led her to her gruesome death at the hands of Cottingham. She made it her life mission to find her missing head, which had been severed from her body, and expose more murders to the families of the victims to give them the closure they needed. To this day, she got in touch with Peter Vronsky, the same forensic historian who had run into Cottingham and had been in touch with him to unearth the motive behind his murders. Vronsky and Weiss have been meeting with Cottingham in prison since the spring of 2017, counseling him to make more confessions. After serving his time in prison quietly for nearly three decades, refusing any media interviews, Cottingham finally agreed to be interviewed by Nadia Fezzani, a journalist and lecturer from Quebec. In this interview, he admitted to the murders and flaunted having killed many more. He also claimed that he would definitely continue killing if he hadn't been arrested. When asked why he cut off the victim's breasts, he answered almost matter-of-factly with no sign of empathy. To do something different. I mean, she was already dead. I mean, it wasn't something that she was alive. And I wanted to create a sensationalism. It's not hard. It's just a body. I mean, it's not a uh, living person no more. After this, he started confessing to more murders under the influence of Detective Robert Anzilotti of the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office. In 2010, he pleaded guilty to the 1967 murder of Nancy Vogel. In 2014, Cottingham confidentially admitted to New Jersey, the murders of three teenage females in 1968 and 1969, Jacqueline, Jackie Harp, who was randomly ambushed by Cottingham as she walked home in the evening from school band practice in Midland Park and 
speckled with the leather strap of her bag, Irene Blaze, 18, who vanished in Hackensack, New Jersey, and was found face down in four feet of water in Saddle River, strangled with a wire, a cord, or perhaps the chain of the crucifix she was wearing. Denise Falsaka, 15, abducted in Emerson, New Jersey, while walking to a friend's home and found the next morning in Saddlebrook, New Jersey, by the side of the road next to a cemetery, strangled with a cord or the chain of her crucifix. In 2021, he pleaded guilty to the 1974 kidnapping, violating, and drowning of Lorraine Marie Kelly, 16, and Mary Ann Proyer, 17, in one of New Jersey's most notorious cold cases. The confession was extracted by Anzalotti, who had spent 15 years interviewing Cottingham, working toward the confession, which raised the total number of victims attributed to Cottingham to 11. He also confessed to the three murders of New Jersey schoolgirls in 1968 to 1969 in return for immunity from prosecution. Jennifer Weiss, Dita's daughter, claimed that the confession may have been due to her involvement. Jennifer had a relationship with Cottingham, which many have difficulty in understanding. Is it possible that we could be blood related then? Jennifer Weiss did what most people would find unethical and impossible. She befriended her mother's killer. She did it to get him to confess, to put a closure to her death. Jennifer's mother was an immigrant from Iran who began sex work to make ends meet. She gave birth to Jennifer and gave her up for adoption. A few days later, she was brutally murdered by Cottingham. Weiss even sending us her childhood photos for comparison with a younger picture of the killer. She said he's open to a DNA test. Jennifer made friends with Cottingham to look for answers, but in that process, she ended up with more questions. Is it possible that her mother's killer was also her father? The uncanny similarities seen in these pictures cannot be missed. Cottingham told Weiss that he had known her mother for a few years. And while she said Cottingham told her it's possible but not probable that he's her father, they have not yet taken any paternity test. Despite the horrific crimes he committed, Weiss said that she now visits Cottingham in prison a few times a month. In fact, she's visited him more than 30 times now and thinks of him like a father. As many daughters do with their boomer relatives, she helps him figure out how to use his iPad. In a picture of the pair, Weiss mimics strangling him. Ironic, because this was his modus operandi for killing his victims. It's truly an unlikely pair. As their strange friendship blossomed, Weiss told Oxygen.com that she has seen some positive change in the torso killer and that she has observed empathy in him. Everybody deserves to be forgiven for things in life. The magnitude of what he did is unfathomable, but I became friends with Richard for my mother's sake and for my quest. I desperately wanted to find Dita's skull, and that is the driving force behind what I'm doing. Whether or not he's telling the truth or not, we are getting bits and pieces of the truth. Earlier this year, Cottingham had been found to have killed 23-year-old Diane Kusick back in 1968 through DNA testing. She had been found physically abused, hurt, and strangled to death in the back seat of her car. As he was linked to Kusick's murder by DNA, authorities believe it to be, thus far, the oldest criminal case to be prosecuted by DNA evidence. He wasn't sentenced for this murder as he sat in a hospital bed. The 75-year-old has little recollection of his crimes and is now suffering from multiple ailments. He confessed after many years of conviction that he truly didn't understand what engulfed him. I was a good Catholic. I said my prayers every day. I went to church every Sunday. I made sure that I went to confession at least once a month. Between October 13th, 1972 and February 13th, 1973, I did in fact murder 13 people. Would you believe it if you were told that an earthquake was the singular reason behind a person's killing more than a dozen people? 
It may not make sense to you, but this is what made 25-year-old Herbert Mullen killed 13 people in a span of four months. And he truly wasn't making anything up. Herbert was born April 18, 1947, a date which held great significance for him. It was the anniversary of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. It was also the anniversary of Albert Einstein's death. Both of these events would, in Herbert's deranged mind, give him a cosmic duty to kill. At school, Herbert's classmates voted him most likely to succeed, but by the time he was 25, he would take the lives of more than a dozen men, women, and children with a knife. He claimed to have done this as he was on an extraordinary mission to save lives through murder. He wanted to do something heroic and significant. In January 1973, Sheriff's Detective Terry Medina encountered a crime scene he would never forget. You know, when you uh, work homicide uh, as long as I did, there are things that get into your mind that you wish you could not have there anymore. It was a cabin in Santa Cruz that haunted the sheriff. The cabin was home to 30-year-old Kathy Francis and her family. There were three bodies that were found in that cabin, Mrs. Francis and her two sons, and they were pretty young. It was Christmas time and their tree as well as the decorations had been broken. Kathy had put up a fight to save her sons who were playing Chinese checkers in their bunk, but the killer sh them all and then stabbed them with a hunting knife. One of them, he had to pull by the foot to draw closer and stab him. The murders continued to get bizarre as people were gripped with unifying fear. The attack had no pattern and the killer could come for anyone. On February 13th, 1973, a single rifle shot rang out on the Santa Cruz cliffs and the mystery began to unravel. 73-year-old Fred Perez was starting some gardening when a young man drove into the quiet neighborhood. Driving down the street on a Sunday morning, the elderly gentleman was shot and killed with the killer driving off. A neighbor had spotted the car leaving and the police soon stopped it. The occupant was Herbert, a seemingly mild-mannered young man. He was unassuming, withdrawn, and quiet. If you looked at him and talked to him, you'd think he was a law-abiding citizen. But investigators soon realized there was more to this quiet and polite young man than met the eye. With Herbert in custody, detectives, including defense investigator Harold Cartwright, began searching for an answer to the question on everyone's lips. Why did he commit these crimes? Cartwright's investigation would begin in Herbert's small hometown of Felton, nestled among the redwoods of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Cartwright found that Herbert had been a well-liked, good football player, even though he was quite small. What made him flip and turn into a serial killer? I remember the first one of the first times I ever got him to say anything in response to one of my questions. We were there, and he wasn't having anything of it, and he finally looked at me, and he just looked up on the table, and he said, when God speaks to you, you listen. This was the first time that the investigators felt that Herbert was not of sound mind. As the case unfolded, it became clear that he was delusional, had feelings of grandiose, all of which indicated that he was schizophrenic. His premise was that he had to save the world after hearing voices. The voices told him that he was one of the chosen people and that it was God's plan that people had to be sacrificed. He was on a mission to prevent cataclysmic earthquakes by killing people. The earthquake was going to take California into the sea, and he had to perform ritual sacrifices to prevent the earthquake from knocking California into the sea. Herbert also claimed that willing victims would offer themselves to him telepathically, though Detective Medina hadn't realized it at the time. In October 1972, he'd responded to the first of Herbert Mullen's murders. The body that was that of a familiar local hobo Lawrence White, known as Whitey, who had been killed for trying to help Herbert with his car. Apart from the voices in his head urging him to kill, it was also found that Herbert did not have a healthy relationship with his father, who had been a military hero in World War II, and was considered stern. He strongly believed his father was the reason he wasn't able to express himself and couldn't identify as bisexual. Herb later testified that his father had threatened to kill anyone 
who would play with Herb during his childhood, and even went door to door, asking that everyone ignore his son. He also urged that it was his father who telepathically commanded his son to murder with these words. Why won't you give me anything? Go kill somebody, move. But this incident that stood out as the trigger to Herb's deteriorating sanity was the tragic death of his best friend, Dean Richardson, who was killed in a car accident after high school graduation. Herb was devastated and fell into a state of Macrabe despair, building shrines in his room to Dean where he spent hours alone. He wondered if Dean's death was some sort of cosmic sacrifice and he became obsessed with the idea of reincarnation. In the spring of 1966, he ran into a friend of Dean's, Jim Guyanera, who gave him some pot and told him about the anti-war movement. Mullen later said Guyanera spearheaded a movement to befuddle and confuse me, and that pot Guyanera gave him damaged his brain. He alienated his longtime girlfriend with his sudden involvement in hallucinogenic drugs. His weird glares and bizarre ramblings gave her the creeps, and he was becoming violent. When he told her in 1968 that he might be gay, the relationship was over. On the surface, Herb's rebellious activities were typical of the times, but his behavior escalated from weird to alarming. One night in 1969, while visiting his sister, he mimicked his brother-in-law's every gesture and word. His sister later described it. When my husband would eat, Herb would eat. Whatever my husband would do, Herb would do. And that went on for four hours. Then he just stared at us. The next day, his family took him to a mental hospital where he voluntarily committed himself, but he was soon out on his own. Herb later asked his sister to sleep with him. And when she declined, he asked if his brother-in-law would sleep with him. Because he had been so normal as a child, the Mullins thought Herb's suddenly scary behavior was drug-induced. It wasn't a stretch to think that Herb was on drugs. Legalized acid was tattooed on his belly. Although he dabbled in acid and pot use, he did not indulge more than his peers. But mixing recreational drugs with mental illness is a concoction for psychosis. From October 13, 1972, and ended in January 13, 1973, he killed 13 people. Mullen bashed the skull of an alcoholic drifter with a baseball bat, eviscerated a female hitchhiker, stabbed a priest to death in his confessional, shot and stabbed a dealer's wife and children and a young married couple, murdered four teenage campers executioner style, and shot a retired boxer with a rifle in his front yard. There was no evident pattern to his mayhem. Mullen himself was articulate and polite, sitting in on Bible study groups and working for Goodwill Industries. The community, which had been horrified by senseless murders, clamored for some sort of rhyme or reason. Yet at the trial, he spouted his bizarre philosophies. Mullen created more questions than he answered. Santa Cruz was shocked that a madman such as this could be roaming the streets. Governor Ronald Reagan's name was also tossed in the whole responsible roster. As the governor of California, his administration rapidly shut down the mental health hospitals in the early 1970s. After Mullen's trial, the jury foreman wrote an open letter to Reagan accusing him and the legislators of being as responsible for the murders as Mullen. Reagan called Mullen's release a psychiatric mistake. Clearly, Mullen was mentally ill with paranoid schizophrenia. He said his victims telepathically gave him permission to kill him, but schizophrenics can choose to disobey their voices. And although many serial killers use mental illness to excuse their heinous behavior, schizophrenics are not more likely to kill than the sane population. So what pushed Mullen over the edge? And would the jury, who saw for themselves that Mullen was genuinely disturbed, find him legally insane? When serial killer Edmund Kemper, who terrorized Santa Cruz in the same time frame, was asked about Herbert, he said he had a lot of pain inside of him, a lot of anguish. Herbert died this year at the age of 75 of natural causes. 
Mullen was tried and convicted of 10 of the murders and confessed to an 11th and was sentenced to multiple life sentences. At the time, California did not have a death penalty. He spent most of his incarceration at the Mule Creek Prison, near Lone. 